and endowed chair for socioeconomics at Heart Research Institute at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And David was previously the chief economist for NOAA, so we're delighted to have him here. He also co-chaired an interagency task force under the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and helped develop a research agenda around coastal green infrastructure and ecosystem services. And he's leading an effort in, um, to inventory and value ecosystem services for the Gulf of Mexico region. So please join me in welcoming David. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jacqueline. Thanks for the invitation. Is this too loud? Is that about right? All right? OK, great. Um, so I had, um, I'm, a, I'm very much a, a blue carbon neophyte. And um, I spent, as Jacqueline mentioned, I spent the last year in, in DC at NOAA headquarters as the chief economist for NOAA. And I received an invitation to, and you, you've heard some uh, reference to it already this morning, the, the Wakoit uh, Bay Nur had a, um, what was the name of that? Steve and Stephanie, it was, it was bringing car blue carbon to markets, or bringing wetlands to market. And they had asked me, uh, as in my role as the chief economist at NOAA, to come in and, and give, some, give a talk on, on blue carbon. I, I, didn't feel giving, I didn't feel comfortable giving a talk on blue carbon and blue carbon markets. There's a lot of other people that are much better versed in that. But I did feel comfortable giving a talk about the value of ecosystem services, of which carbon or gas sequestration and storage is one of those. And so I wanted to give some of that same talk to you today, because there's only actually a few people in the room today that were, that was at, uh, that were at that meeting. Um, but I also, um, and, and so it's going to have a, a bit of a kind of a lessons learned uh, at the federal level and, and policy. Um, Stephanie mentioned some policy on, you know, on ramp to how we might be able to integrate blue carbon. There's been a lot that's actually happened just over the last few months in terms of directives out of the White House that eventually starts to trickle its way down through the mission agencies and actually starts to change action and policy in the, in the region. And so I want to bring attention to that towards the end of the talk. But I want to spend a good portion of the, of the talk just talking about what do we mean by value and, we, and value of our, our different ecosystem services. Uh, and then part of that also, I'm going to la ask Lauren, introduced herself a little while ago. Lauren works with me at, at HRI and is doing some very interesting work regionally on trying to understand uh, carbon storage for marsh and mangrove uh, above ground, below ground biomass, and then in soil. And I want her to take a few moments to share that with you because I think it's important to have what, what data do we have regionally, locally, to be able to, you know, put some meat on the bone and move out potentially on a carbon market, not only in Texas, but throughout the Gulf. So when I was first was thinking of blue carbon, I was thinking of this. I was, think, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of the Hope Diamond, and, and I don't know how many of you have had a chance to see that at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. It's, uh, it's probably one of the most photographed exhibits at, at the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, it's hard to actually get in there and actually see a clear view of it because people are flat, you know, shooting their cameras and flashing a lot. Um, but it's blue, and it's a diamond. It's very large, um, and it looks all the better with a bunch of the white diamonds around it. Um, but this is carbon-based, and this is blue. And I was thinking, you know, is, is that really what we mean when we're moving forward here with blue carbon? And I, of course, I know that not to be the case, but I was thinking, well, how could I take this a little further? And our, our wetlands, coastal wetlands especially, because that's why we're here, any less valuable than this piece of blue carbon. And so moving forward in this idea of value, we have something in economics called the paradox of value. And so as a, as, a, as a professor, I'm going to lecture a little bit here, but at a, at, a, at a higher level that we're all comfortable with. It's called the diamond water paradox. And the idea here, and this was actually put forth by Adam Smith in the mid-1700s. Some of you may know Adam Smith as kind of one of the uh, early economic philosophers, mo modern for his time in the 1700s, of economic philosopher. And the idea here is that al although water is more useful, right, we need it to survive, than diamonds, diamonds command a higher price and are thought of as more valuable. So that's, that's the paradox here, is that we use water, you know, and don't really think of its value, um, don't really, although that's a little, that's obviously changing in, in our region of the world, uh, 
Um, but diamonds are of little practical use, but yet they command a lot of attention and they command a lot of value. So I was wanted to take it one step further and move out of the water diamond paradox. Maybe talk about the wetlands diamond paradox. So are wetlands worth less than diamonds? I mean, should we be giving the same sort of attention to our national wetlands as we do to all the advertisements to sell people diamonds? Do they serve as an important function as water does? And obviously, we, you know, these are questions at a very high level, and even more so than diamonds. So one of the things that we first need to be able to do is demonstrate value. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we generate thoughts of value. But value can be demonstrated either monetarily, you know, the change and the money that we have in our pockets, although we are carrying less and less of that today. We use a lot of electronic money. Um, but that's still dollars, or it could be pounds, or it could be gold, bullion, yen, euros, whatever you want to do. So value can be demonstrated via monetary instruments. Or they can be non-monetary. Okay? You can simply, values can be demonstrated by, you know, A-OK, -okay, thumbs up, red, green, uh, yellow, um, so signal, one, two, three, some ranking system. There's many, what I want to do here is demonstrate that there's many ways to demonstrate or show value, quanti begin to quantify value. So for me, this, this, this graphic here, and I know it's going to be hard for you to see in the back, so I'll, I'll move through it a little bit. This graphic here, I started, well, I think we did this way back probably four or five years ago, um, to help me better understand how we move from a biophysical, what I'm going to call a biophysical feature, seagrass, marsh, mangrove, through this idea of what's the biophysical functioning of that biophysical feature. In this case, seagrass, photosynthesis, three-dimensional structure. We could put in here oyster reef, we could put in marsh, we could put in mangrove. How does that move into ecological function? So what is the place of that biophysical feature within some larger system? You know, it's, it pr provides habitat, modified current velocity, etc. And the idea here is then all that structure, function, and the processes of that biophysical feature how does that eventually lead to ecosystem services? And then, quite honestly, what we're really concerned about is how it impacts human well-being. So ecosystem services, you know, what we're talking about here today is gas regulation. But, you know, seagrass and all these other habitats provide a lot more ecosystem services. And, and we'll talk about some of that in a little bit later. But what's really interesting to me is this idea of constituents of well-being, because this is where value comes from. This is where human values come from. And so this big, long process here, finally from the biophysical feature to this idea of constituents of well-being, so what's important to us, our personal safety, access to clean water, strength, feeling well, recreational opportunities, those are the things that we as humans begin to value. But there's this causal chain that we need to work back to through that very beginning, and that's that, that biophysical feature. So this helps me in, in the work that I do in, in valuing ecosystem services, identifying, quantifying, and valuing ecosystem services to think about that causal connection. So what about the value of blue carbon itself? Um, Stephanie earlier on gave a, a great um, presentation. It's kind of setting the foundation for our understanding of, of blue carbon. Steve, after me, is going to drill down even, even deeper. Um, so for the value of blue carbon as one of the ecosystem services that a particular biophysical feature, habitat, whatever you may want to call it, produces, where, where would that value be generated? So for us in economics, value is generated at the intersection of supply and demand. And I'm not going to draw supply and demand curves up here. I'll save you from that. But it's the coming together of what is available to be supplied of a particular good or service and what is demanded of that particular good and service. So for blue carbon, where is that value going to be generated? Well, it's no surprise it's going to be on the demand side because in terms of being able to supply blue carbon projects, I don't think there's any doubt that we would be able to do that in terms of restoration and protection activities. The issue right now, though, is where is the demand for those activities going to come from? 
And so in order to begin to v value blue carbon as a service itself, we need to generate more demand. And some of that, Stephanie showed in, in her presentation earlier, the carbon, the market in, uh, compliance market in California, $25 million that was used to, for restoration activities, that is generating demand and begin, beginning to demonstrate some value of that market. But we've also talked about this a bit this morning. Does blue carbon go it alone? I mean, is it only blue carbon that is going to be able to have enough resources to put projects in the ground to conserve what we already have? And you know, thinking about this idea of co-benefits, we always talk about those, no matter what specific ecosystem services we're, we're interested in. So carbon sequestration and the co-benefits, storm protection and the co-benefits, recreational fisheries enhancement and the co-benefits, right? But we never talk about all the benefits together. We're always talking about something and the co-benefits. And I think that's an opportunity in capturing the complete value of what's emanating from a system, what's emanating from a particular biophysical feature, whether it be wetlands, marsh, mangrove, oyster reefs, et cetera. So I want to turn it over for a few slides to, to Lauren to talk a little bit about her work in looking at um, a meta-analysis of what's happening in the northern Gulf in terms of being able to capture um, soil uh, carbon storage above ground, below ground, and soil carbon. Oh, I mean, OK. Why don't I just do this? This will be easy. I'll, I'll hold it. OK. Uh, so basically, I did a meta-analysis of um, all the data that I could find in the peer-reviewed literature um, and in the northern Gulf of Mexico for marshes, salt marshes, and mangroves. And so I looked at above-ground biomass, below-ground biomass, and soil carbon. And those three things together make up uh, carbon storage. Thank you. Oh, okay. um, and so above-ground biomass is the vegetation above the soil level, right? So um, stems, leaves, that kind of stuff. Below-ground biomass is the roots and rhizomes. And then soil carbon is all that particulate carbon that gets stored in the soil. And for the meta-analysis, I looked at below-ground biomass and soil carbon to only 20 centimeters depth, so not very far. Maybe, maybe you should share people with meta-analysis. Oh, and so a meta-analysis, um, it's basically a collection, or just collecting all the data that I could find um, in a quantitative way. So um, a literature review would just look at what I could find, but a meta-analysis actually combines it uh, statistically. So data is collected a lot of different ways by researchers. It's collected on a one-time basis um, or on a mean basis, so they collect multiple times per year. Um, and in a lot of t cases, researchers are targeting peak biomass. Um, and so I had, all, I had a lot of data in these different compartments, but I had to do statistical analyses to see if I could actually combine them. Um, in some cases I could, in some cases I couldn't. Um, so basically for marshes, for above ground biomass, I could only use the mean values. Even though I had a lot of data that was collected on a one-time basis, I couldn't combine it with those mean values. Um, for below ground biomass, I could combine them and also for soil carbon. Then for mangroves, um, I could not find any data in the northern Gulf of Mexico for above ground biomass. Um, minimal data for below ground biomass, so I couldn't actually look at the comparison between marshes and mangroves. And the only situation where I could compare marshes to mangroves was for soil carbon, but I could only look at the one time um, values. <coughs> So these are preliminary results. Um, green is above ground biomass, brown is below ground biomass, and gray is soil carbon. And for the distant, and this is in grams of carbon per meter squared. So basically you can see that there's at least twice as much below ground biomass for salt marshes as there is above ground biomass. And then you have a lot more soil carbon. This is to 20 centimeters depth, so 
um, a lot more soil carbon than the below ground biomass. And then similar values for um, marshes and mangroves for soil carbon. Is that it? Oh. Um, so basically there's a lack of data for above ground biomass and below ground biomass um, for states other than Florida for the mangroves. Um, and what was I going to say about that? Oh, but above ground biomass for mangroves can be estimated using allometric equations, uh, one, of them, one of which was developed by Oslin et al. in 2014. Um, a lot of reason, well, the main reason we don't have above ground biomass data for mangroves is that you'd have to actually go in there and cut down a tree. And that's kind of look, looked upon negatively versus just cutting down a grass that's going to grow back the next, the next year. Um, but for the meta-analysis, we didn't want to use any allometric equation or any data that was derived from allometric equations. We want to look at data that was actually sampled. Um, so, so there's an opportunity to fill that data gap by just allowing people to use allometric equations. Um, also, a lot of the peak biomass data that we had may not actually be capturing peak values. So the peak data sets that we had actually had values that were, <coughs> excuse me, lower than the mean values. So it could be that collecting on um, an annual basis multiple times per year is actually preferred to trying to target peak biomass or just collecting on a one-time basis. Um, and if y'all have any questions about the details about um, you know geographic distribution and all of that, I can fill you in on the details. Great. So, so why, did, why did I insert those four slides into my presentation on basically the value of ecosystem services and, and um, value of, of societal benefits of blue carbon? Because for me, if we're talking about doing something regionally here within Texas or even, even the northern Gulf of Mexico, um, to be able to prove up the value of a restoration activity that has blue carbon we're going to need science like this to be able to justify any projects that we want to put on the ground. So I think what I wanted to take the time for Lauren to demonstrate you know, where there is data and where there are gaps that we need to begin to fill. So what are some of the sticks and carrots in terms of um, ecosystem services, which blue carbon is part of, gas regulation, um, that exists out there. And this is that, as I said, this is really coming from the, exper from the experience of the last year serving as the chief economist of NOAA um, and how these will begin to, to, to trickle down. Well, one of the problems that blue carbon su suffers from is from non-proximal demand and supply. And what do I mean by that? Well, storm protection and fishing occur at very defined locations. I know that if I go out back here, and hopefully if I'm fishing today or tomorrow, that you know, I know where to fish for redfish around that marsh edge or around that oyster reef. I know that service where exactly where it will take place, along with storm protection. That marsh mangrove oyster reef is protecting me at a very defined location. But for blue carbon, for gas regulation, gas services, that, that happens everywhere. But there, are, there are supply everywhere as well as, more importantly, De demand or beneficiaries exist all across the planet. So that, that's a bit of, the, we, we, that's a bit of the, uh, the conundrum that we find ourselves in. So the work that California is doing, we are beneficiaries of. In terms of the carbon, right? But in terms of all those co-benefits, obviously those are more proximal. So what are the policy directives um, that exist now to help Blue carbon markets uh, develop um, are they necessary are are necessary but they're not sufficient. Um, obviously, in this region of the country, involvement by private sector firms, landholders in particular, which are both individuals as well as large corporation. The largest owner of wetlands in Louisiana, coastal wetlands, is who? Conoco Phillips. Right, so so it's not only the individual land owner, but it's also large corporations that are our necessary partners. So some important first steps, and and I'm not going to talk a lot about this because Stephanie drilled down into this very nicely. And and I was we were back in when was the uh, Wakoit Bay 
that was back in the early spring, I think, that, that meeting. And I know at that time, talking with Steve and Steve, um, that you know, there was real hope that it was going to be coming out soon, coming out soon. So hopefully any day now, St Stephanie says that, that uh, it's going to be, be approved. But what's the benefit of this? Well, the benefit of this, this work that Restore America's Estuaries and all its partners have, have put into this to create this, um, this standard methodology is that it starts to create certainty. And one, it's applicable worldwide. Well, the combination of certainty, okay, that's very important to private sector, as well as, as individual landowners, especially individual landowners that have been on the land for generation. Certainty is important. And then obviously transferability of a methodology, the ac applicability worldwide is really important for participation. And that's all I'm gonna say about that because Stephanie did a great job of covering that. So what about opening up in the policy space at the federal level, as I said, that starts to trickle down through the mission agencies, NOAA, DOI, EPA, et cetera, that eventually impacts uh, regional um, opportunities? Well, back in 2011, the President's Council uh, of Advisors in Science and Technology moved out very explicitly on this idea of incorporating ecosystem services or accounting for the benefits that society receives from our natural environment and wanted to launch a series of efforts to assess thoroughly the condition of the U.S. ecosystem and social and economic value of the services. So that was back in 2011. We've had a lot of work done since then. Um, this was hopefully to impact, as, as Stephanie said earlier, regulations, everything from NERDA to Magnuson-Stevens, which is Magnuson-Stevens' uh, the, st the uh, regulations that affect uh, fe federal fisheries management, but uh, everything from NEPA to coastal zone management, um, uh, WERDA, so this is uh, principles and guidelines or principles and requirements, that's really important in our area. Any, any work that has to do with water projects now are directed to incorporate ecosystem services into, the, into accounting for the benefits uh, or, protect, or protect, potentially detriment of ecosystem services. So the space is there, it's getting better, it's just a matter really of applying it. Um, Stephanie mentioned, or uh, uh, Jacqueline mentioned this in, in her introduction to me, something that came out just within um, this past August, a couple of months ago, was this White House Task Force on Coastal Green Infrastructure and Ecosystem Services. Um, this was really uh, part of the effort after Hurricane Sandy. There was a recognition that the federal government was behind the times and really thinking about the importance of coastal green infrastructure. Ideally, yes, for protection against storms, but also realizing, as we've said before, all the additional co-benefits that, that coastal green infrastructure, well-placed and well thought of, could provide uh, various uh, ecosystem services. So this came out just this past August. Um, it's really a research strategy for the federal family, so all the major mission agencies um, over the next 10, of 15, 10 to 15 years. The big call here was to explicitly link biophysical structure function to human well-being. And I think for the discussion that we're going to have here today, they need places to pilot the work. So yes, it's directed at storm protection. But where you can show connections to blue carbon, right, fisheries enhancement, shoreline protection, just brings value to potential projects. Um, Department of Commerce which NOAA sits in, um, has, is, has had a series of what they call natural capital roundtables um, starting last uh, spring. It's part of their strategic plan. Uh, these series of roundtables are looking at how does private sector now begin to engage in natural capital more effectively? What, what does private sector possibly need from the Department of Commerce, which also holds the Census Bureau, Economics and Statistics Administration, to more effectively move out on this idea of natural capital. Um, we had the first round table in Houston uh, back in the spring and mainly at that gathering because we're kind of dividing up in the country and the, and the, the prominent industries in, the, in those sections of the country, we had energy. Um, everything from energy development, so major oil and gas, to energy providers such as Entergy, which is uh, energy provider, provides electrons to houses. And, and industry and carbon sequestration without any prodding from us organizers carbon sequestration 
uh, figured prominently in the discussions about where they thought in their own businesses they could move out on more effectively. Um, so I think there's real opportunity to engage, in, at least in this region, um, energy sector more effectively. Well, let me, let me back up before I do the, the communicating part of it. I've, I didn't put a slide on here. Uh, a month ago, um, the White House also issued to all the mission agencies a memorandum directing them to begin to, in their operations, more effectively incorporate ecosystem services. Um, that's everything from project selection to um, evaluation to monitoring, et cetera. That, that, that's what we call now the guidance memorandum, the technical memorandum of how you actually do that was going to come out next summer. Why that's important is because this, the, the, the stick there is that with the Office of Management and Budget, which the mission agency, all the agencies have to go through to get their budgets approved or, or negotiated with, will be holding the agencies accountable for that. So blue carbon here can figure prominently in helping the agencies meet their goal of incorporating ecosystem services in the projects, monitoring, et cetera, that they have to move out on. So I think there, there is another opportunity to go to the mission agencies and encourage them to move out on blue carbon, given just this memorandum from the White House that came out um, less than a month ago. And finally, just in this, in this last minute here, uh, what's really important, I think, is communicating it. You know, whatever the it is, the it today is talking about blue carbon. For me, sometimes it's talking about oyster reef restoration and the benefits of, of, of fishing and shoreline protection that can come from that. Whatever the it is, we need a better job of communicating it. You know, whether it's to our grandmothers here, and this is a pretty tough looking group, so if you can get them to understand it, and get them on board, you've done a lot. But even to our neighbors, and I talk about, I mean, my poor neighbor, I use my neighbor as an example a lot about being able to communicate whatever the, the academic or policy thing that I'm working on, be able to get them to understand. Because there is a huge amount of untapped potential um, uh, bottom up uh, uh, individuals that we could get involved with thinking about what's important in restoring and protecting our coastal habitats, blue carbon being one of them, but all the other additional add-on uh, co-benefits as well. And so I think I just hit my mark <laughs> at 11.15, so thank you. I didn't leave any time for questions, maybe a question or two? Maybe a question or two, yes. Do you know which industries or industry trade groups in this coastal bend area are kind of in the in the lead of looking at some of these issues you're talking about or might have been in that Houston meeting? Yeah, so so the the individuals at the Houston meeting were mainly from were mainly mainly the major oil and gas, you know, so so the Shells, the ConocoPhillips, um, Exxon Mobiles, et cetera, um, Chevrons and then Entergy. So the kind of the the larger players that you would ex would expect in Houston. Um, obviously, I mean, a big player in this is port and the port industries, right? So uh, that's where I was headed. Yeah, e exactly. And so I think that's for me. I haven't personally uh, started a conversation with those individuals, but obviously, I think it's it's ripe for opportunity. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, join me in thanking David for Thank you, giving us a very enlightening talk. All right, and as we transition uh, for a moment here, we are going to do another couple of trivia giveaways. So what I'd like to do, you can, I guess, turn your attention this way so I can see all of you briefly. Um, who wants to name, if we're thinking about these ecosystem services and, and co-benefits of these blue carbon projects, who feels confident that they can name, well, there's probably 86 million, who can name three co-benefits of Blue Carbon Projects? First hand up. Is, is that intimidating? <laughs> the value of doing these projects. Start us out. Sure, absolutely. So just go ahead and repeat those. Erosion control, recreation opportunities, and provision of habitat. All right. Now we have a uh, now we have a bonus round. Can anybody name another one? 
Ah, nutrient regulation. Very cool. All right, good job. See, now we're forcing you guys to pay attention, right? Are you ready, Jacqueline? Oh, Are we all good? I gone? Okay, good. <laughs> Can everybody hear Steve okay? Yep. Can you hear so me? I think I'd so like okay. to introduce Steve Crooks. He's been working with us throughout this in, entire project and been at every one of our workshops. Um, Steve Crooks is the Director of Climate Change Services for Environmental Science Associates. He's also the co-chair of the International Blue Carbon Scientific Working Group. Uh, he's a wetland scientist, a restoration practitioner, and a geomorphologist. He's the founder of the International Blue Carbon Initiative, and he also is a member of the IPCC working group that drafted the 2013 guidelines to include wetlands within our national greenhouse gas inventory. So we're pleased to have Steve here and welcome me in joining him. Yep, thank you very much. Oh, very nice introduction. Thank you. And, and thank you for the presentations earlier. I'm going to try and build on them a little bit and drill down into some of the information that Stephanie was given and sort of bridge to what's going to come from Scott and then the examples this afternoon. Um, I want to talk about how we sort of factor in blue carbon into some of the project planning that we do. Um, but what I'm going to actually, actually we've got a photograph of mangroves in there, which this is actually Guyana, um, mangrove restoration project, but um, I was going to take it out, but then I realized there's mangroves here too, so it became topical. Um, what I'm not going to talk about is these wider ecosystem services that, that David was mentioning. I'm going to focus on um, the carbon aspect, but as David mentioned, really for the local value, all these other ecosystem services are far more important but it's the global aspect that's got us interested in the, the carbon perspective. What I'm also not going to mention is all the other blue carbon activities which are taking place around the world. There's a whole network of demonstration projects. Uh, there's Guyana again, sort of building up where we're trying to understand and quantify the stocks and trying to int integrate these into different levels of environmental protection and conservation around the world. But I'm going to focus on the US. Um, what I will mention a little bit, but I would wish I'd be talking more about, is exactly what David was talking about here. How do we link blue carbon with grey-green infrastructure, natural infrastructure, and coastal systems? And there's a lot of work going on in like improving flood management by in in including wetlands within the landscape. But blue carbon fits very nicely with this, and we can, we can, I'd, I'd like to talk a lot more about how we start bringing these things together. Uh, what I will mention, maybe Stephanie can hold this up, is that the International Blue Carbon Scientific Working Group brought out a manual, there we are, very nicely modeled, um, of, uh, to try and help standardize data collection, data analysis for carbon stocks, carbon sequestration. And so there's a manual that can be downloaded uh, from the blueCarbonInitiative.org, and it includes all of this. And uh, if you want a hard copy, I think if you contact um, I don't have any more hard copies with me, but we can, we can get hard copies to people if they would like one. Yeah, and there's also a link in the resources in your folder that in there. And so I'll come back to uh, carbon stock assessments in, in just a little while. Now, David touched a lot upon this, and you know, one of the ways that we try and think about it, like to give the biggest picture, what we're trying to do really as we think about these issues is inform uh, environmental policy, environmental practice. Now, there's some old models um, which exist on how we try and connect things together. This is the PSI, uh, PSIR framework. Um, there are drivers which cause pressures within, and by, within, human, within landscapes, uh, flooding, nutrient loading, uh, industrial pollution, sewage, water needs, which lead to a state change in the environment, um, reduction to habitat area, you know, urbanization, eutrophication, and these cause, these cause a welfare impact, you know, reduced welfare, um, reduced lifespan for people or ecology, moral impacts, fisheries decline, which lead to a policy response potentially. And we want to try and get into a positive cycle rather than a negative cycle in terms of these activities. And so many of us work in this sort of field, you know, looking at envir environmental impacts leading to a state change. And what David really nicely covered there was the the measuring the welfare impacts and leading that back into a policy response. And so we want to try and include blue carbon in this, both in terms of the adaptation perspective, you know, how do we reduce the pressures directly to uh, impacts that are taking place, 
but also how do we feed into the mitigation aspect as well? How do we try and touch upon both of these aspects here? Now, from an adaptation side or from the restoration side that you know, many of us are involved in, you know, what we're trying to do here is take some sort of degraded system, a coastal system, where it's, uh, its natural boundaries to, you know, maintenance, natural resilience has been gradually declining through time. And there's nothing on the axis here. This could be species number. It could be any sort of metric that you, you might measure resilience in. And uh, we're trying to increase the capacity of these systems to respond resiliently to shocks and stresses. Human systems also. But what we have to recognize in the coastal environment is we have shifting baselines. We have things which are going to change through time. Sea level rise, species migration, hydrology is going to change potentially. And this is one of the things that are very difficult for planners because planners is based around static landscapes. So we have to incorporate in this kind of baseline change through time. Now Steph showed this figure, and this is the way carbon people think. You know, what you're trying to do in terms of baseline is, is there a point around here? Yeah. What you're trying to do in terms of baseline is have a net improvement through time. Now you might have a landscape which is not emitting carbon, and say you grow trees or you do wetlands restoration, and you make the situation better through time. You might have a declining baseline. You have a peatland or an organic soil which is emitting CO2. And by having the project, you avoid those ongoing emissions, but you also sequester some carbon. Or you might have an improving situation. You're already doing really well, and you make it better. Or if you're declining situation, you make it le less worse. And what Stephanie was emphasizing which is that it's the, it's the net change which is important to carbon management. So we need to try and connect both the adaptation side and the mitigation side together when we're thinking about coastal systems. Now, we brought out a report at the climate change negotiations last year to try and help weave some of these things together. You know, there's a lot of projects building up. You know, people are starting to throw $25 million out here and there, and we want projects to be successful. So, you know, as, the, as, as we've worked through, you know, our experience over the last 40 years, you know, we've started to recognize the value of wetlands, and we've started to establish good practice on wetlands conservation and wetlands restoration at the small scale, and then becoming progressively bigger. Uh, and you know, we're starting to work in different parts of the world, some places faster than others, just on achieving multi-use landscapes that we're incorporating wetlands in. And getting to there is a really good goal. But now we're making it more complicated, and people are oh, goodness. Because now we have to include an ad adaptation to climate change, and you know, we're getting guidance that we need to include greenhouse gases as well into this. So increasingly, we're thinking about landscape-level processes, building planning around that, and trying to weave together projects. Now, in terms of what we might call blue carbon interventions, you know, we, we've talked about markets already, but I think as David, David nicely point out, pointed out, um, there are also policy activities that you could do, or could be done. Shifting of budgets to help encourage more restoration, more conservation away from other activities. Changes in management actions. You know, maybe as a landowner, there may be something you could do on your land, or as your, part of your agency, to change the greenhouse gas budget. Uh, that's worth it. And then there's carbon finance projects, which may be a small percentage, but may be a percentage of potential activities. And I'll come back to some of those. You know, the, the, what we've seen in California, that $25 million, is an example of a policy-based approach until a compliance market can adopt coastal wetlands. Now, um, just to reiterate a little bit of what Stephanie said, uh, you know, the way things have de developed in terms of uh, including ecosystems, uh, landscapes represent around about 25% of all emissions globally. Now, uh, forests are a large part of that, and a lot of activity you know, over the last 20 years has really focused on forests. And then around about 10, 15 years ago, the peat people said, hold on a second, where's the soils in all of this discussion? We need to factor soils in. And so a lot of work has been focused on uh, peat emissions around the world. And then a number of us started to, to speak up, and it began really in the COP of 2010 in Cancun, where we said, well, on, let's include some of these coastal wetlands as well. They have mangroves, have the above ground biomass, just like the trees do in forests, but they also have the soils as well. And the existing developing frameworks for uh, greenhouse gas management on landscapes, they can be extended down slope. It's okay to get your feet wet and include wetlands as part of this process. And that's the way the, the discussions have been pushing in the last few years. Just to get sure what it looks like, you, know, you all will know this, but this is a typical cross-section of wetland. Here it represents maybe 500 to 1,000 years of gradual sediment accumulation here in a fairly mineral system, San Francisco Bay. Not much biomass, but we've got you know, long-term carbon storage. Uh, 
Now that the sequestration rate, it's actually gradual, slow amount of carbon sequestration. If you drain this, you release all that carbon very quickly, just within a few years. So the emissions curve is a lot sharper than the sequestration. So there's a lot more value on, this, on the protecting intact carbon stocks. Now, in terms of the status of the science, you know, we've been thinking about carbon in terms of ecosystems for a long time. You know, it started out with outwelling hypothesis, the support of fisheries. You know, there was back in the 70s and 80s some work on uh, greenhouse gases, fluxes. In, the, uh, in terms of mangroves and marshes, but didn't pick up. But then really, around about 2000, it started building momentum. We've got a lot of momentum right now. In the last two months alone, we've had two articles in Nature, or the science community's had two articles in Nature related to blue carbon. And there seems to be one every three months these days. So we've got one in science, which I'm sure will be rejected very quickly. They're very good at that. And um, so we'll see. I'm going to be heartbroken by the weekend. But um, there's a lot of real interest right now. And as Stephanie mentioned, we're losing wetlands very quickly. It could be dam construction, direct impacts. Aquaculture is huge. I just mentioned, for every shrimp cocktail that you eat, you can drive a 1,000 miles on that carbon footprint. So if there's one thing I do today, if I put you off farm shrimp, then that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, aquaculture, direct impacts. I'll come back to this one. There's a big methane emission associated with this, as well as carbon. And then there's direct coastal development. Stephanie mentioned this, just to reiterate, most of the carbon is within the soils. You know, even for really big mangroves that you might find in, in Colombia and Ecuador and Costa Rica and Indonesia, most of it is in, in the soils. And to emphasize the amount of uh, carbon that's lost, this is some work collected by Boone Kaufman and colleagues working in uh, the Dominican Republic. Now these are all different statues of mangroves. You can't really tell how much carbon stock is between the dwarf mangrove, which is this big, and the, and the tall mangroves. Um, this is the soil carbon, and this is the, the biomass. But when you convert this ecosystem, you convert it to something that's drained, in this case a shrimp pond, the carbon stocks diminish from around about you know, 2,500 tons of CO2 um, per hectare um, down to you know, less than 500. And that's an, almost an immediate impact just by draining those lands. You know, thousands of years worth of carbon going straight back to the atmosphere. And this led to a study um, that we, we looked uh, at a global impact in 2012. Uh, we know how much degradation of coastal wetlands is there taking place around the world? And what are the greenhouse gas implications of that? And a lot of conservative assumptions went into this. And it was estimated that around about 450 million tons of CO2 are released each year from the loss of coastal wetlands and the ongoing releases um, from uh, drained organic soils. And we assume 20 years, but in places like California, it's been going on for more than 100 years. So we used a lot of conservative assumptions. So that emission is around about the emission of California each year. And that's ongoing from drained coastal wetlands. Our error bars are very wide. Could be as low as 150. Could be as high as a gigaton. So that's about the amount of Japan releases out there. What this doesn't include, this is just CO2 emissions. I'm going to touch upon methane emissions in a little while. We don't include the impacts of methane standing water within this, uh, within this uh, activity. So we may be underestimating the numbers, but the numbers are actually significant. That represents around about 25% of uh, deforestation through forestry, to give you a sense of scale. So that's what's captured the international discussions, recognizing that while the areas are small, it's a marginal increase in benefit for greenhouse gas mitigation. But you also get these enormous core benefits as well. And so there's value in including coastal wetlands as well as other greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. So what we've been trying to do, this is kind of our game plan, is we're trying to work at different levels of, uh, from community to international neg negotiations. Um, at the local level, we're trying to work with groups like this, and it's fantastic to see you all here. You know, how can we work on improving the quantification, increasing the discussion about blue carbon within the community, raising awareness? How can we uh, identify synergies with conservation and restoration and build a demonstration project? At the top end, you know, working um, with people like the chief economist of, of NOAA and, uh, you know, working with the White House, working with international teams, that do, working the negotiations on climate change mitigation practices, uh, working with the IPCC on greenhouse gas accounting principles, 
and trying to develop multinational projects. So we're trying to work at the multinational level scale, but also then at the national scale with different governments. Um, I'll show some examples of that. The developing federal policies, the, the greenhouse gas accounting. How do we connect across between here to here? Because if you have this without this, you don't get very far. And if you have this without these, you also don't get so far. Trying to connect all these things together. Uh, the IPCC, um, this was a, an important step, a good piece of luck for us. Um, they brought out greenhouse gas accounting guidelines in 2013. And what those guidelines do is they provide the tools that countries can estimate the emissions and reductions associated with management of lands within their boundaries. Um, and when they, uh, in 2000, there's existing guidelines for forests, croplands, settlements, grasslands. What was really missing was wetlands within it. And so the supplement in 2013 provided that additional information on, on wetlands. And that's out on the street. And uh, countries, the US, are now applying that. I'll come back to that. This is what's in there. Um, the main chapters focus around how to calculate emissions on land from drained inland organic soils. And then if you re-wet them, how do you calculate the reductions of CO2 emissions, but also increase in methane emissions? We managed to get chapter four, coastal wetlands, inserted there too. So what happens if you drain or restore coastal wetlands? How do you account for that? And then there's inland wetlands, constructed wetlands, and then cross-cutting issues for reporting. So this is out there, and countries are now starting to apply it. And if you count it, then you can see it, and then there's more likely to be action to avoid it. Um, the White House last uh, two weeks ago, when we were there, asked how can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions by five million tons over the next, you know, each year, over, through restoration and conservation. So these levels of interest is, is building up. So hopefully it'll flow through to more restoration activities. The um, NOAA and the EPA are leading an initiative to try and bring coastal wetlands into the national accounts for the US. And so what we've been looking at is what are the main sources of emissions and reductions? And this is where you can help, because we have, we have real issues with, with data that we need to try and fill. Um, main source of emissions, drainage and excavation. You know, just like in Louisiana, digging all of those channels through the wetlands, there's a direct emission associated with that, that dis disturbance to stocks. Human induced subsidence. You know, when you, if you extract from an aquifer underneath a wetland or you redirect sediment supply, that wetland eventually drowns out, waves resuspend the material, and the portion of that carbon goes back to the atmosphere. Can we try and account for that? That's a big one, and I'll come back to some of the numbers. Um, well, actually, I'll, 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 I'll chat through some of the numbers. We estimate that on, on natural wetlands around the country, we're probably sequestering around about 10 million tons of CO2 each year. From loss of the Mississippi Delta, we're losing around about 10 million tons of CO2 each year. That, you know, that balances almost exactly the entire sequestration in the country. Methane emissions, impounded waters. If you build a road across a wetland and you cut off the salinity, you now get standing fresh water behind, you get degraded ecosystems sometimes. That increases the methane emission. That's the paper that we're working on with the USGS right now. We estimate for the East Coast alone, there might be somewhere of one to three million tons of CO2 equivalents being released from those standing waters. And there's a lot of standing waters in the Gulf. We haven't quantified that yet. So, and there's some in, in the East Coast, on the West Coast. So methane emissions, and that's one of the easier things to restore because you just open up the, the, the levee and you let salt water back in. So there's, there's something there. Forestry activities on coastal wetlands, we don't have a lot of data for that. It's something that we need to, to work on. Restoration, um, you can avoid some of the emissions. You can bring back carbon sequestration. I forget what the numbers were, maybe a million to two million tons. We think we can get through restoration again, maybe a bit more. And then aquaculture. Actually, this is really big in other countries. For us, it probably represents, uh, through nitrous oxide emissions, around about 200,000 tons of CO2. So not a big number, but it is, it is something. So we're trying to work on the quantification, and this is what we're going to bring into the, uh, the US report on emissions and sinks um, next year. And then we're going to report back to the international community. Uh, to try and do that, we've been very lucky in terms of the timing. Uh, there is a, a research project that is funded by the USGS and, and NASA to help quantify carbon stocks at the local level and see if we can connect that to remote sensing data and then scale up across the country. Uh, there's 18 PIs involved in this project. Uh, Texas A&M uh, represents. We have Rusty Fagan on there, a remote sensing specialist. Uh, 
Um, and we're trying to connect together remote sensing and carbon stock change assessment. Um, we're focused on uh, the burial part of the equation. Well, there's all these complicated fluxes that go, go on across the, the, the land-ocean interface. And there's a group uh, under Ray Nature who is working on these fluxes. We're focused on the burial component, as that is really the carbon sequestration aspect that falls into infantry calculation. And the way we're doing it, we're lucky that NOAA has already, since 1996, has um, the uh, Coastal Change Analysis Program. And they calculate land use change. And it goes into the Status and Trends Report, along with the uh, Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife NWI. So those two databases together give us a really nice baseline for the amount of land use change around the country. Can we then ascribe from local emissions factors, and emissions factors, the amount of carbon that occurs when there's an activity, the amount of release or sequestration, connect that together with land use change to get an assessment of changes in carbon stock change. And so we're trying this at a very high level, what's called a tier one, which would be a national level. We think we can get down to sub-national sort of climate zones. We would like to try and get down to finer levels of detail. Uh, we have a number of sentinel sites uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, parts of San Francisco Bay, Wakoit Bay, uh, Chesapeake, um, Shark uh, River Valley, and then uh, part of Louisiana here, the Terrebonne. Uh, we have key areas missing. Texas is missing. And, um, and South, uh, the, the Carolinas are missing also. So it's very interesting to hear about the data that was being collected um, here. Because you know, trying to build up data sets in this area w would help this process. So we can, we're trying to build up the, the, the activities on the Sentinel sites. And we're hoping that it will expand um, to more areas um, in the future. Um, this is, we're trying to connect this to some existing national databases. CERGO is the uh, USAID, uh, US um, Agricultural, the Agricultural Services soil database. And they have a database on soil carbon stocks. And we're sort of QCing and trying to bring this into the assessment. Uh, as well as that, we're including remote sensing of above ground biomass and trying to develop um, those kind of techniques. So having data on the above ground biomass, we can feed in to help um, calibrate these systems. And then we're including the response to sea level rise as well as part of, uh, part of this analysis. And as part of this, we, we're trying to build, there's going to be a meeting at the USGS in January to develop a standardized database so that if you collect data, there's a database that you can put it into, so it goes into a community database. There'll be ways of working out the IP, the um, intellectual property of how that data is used. That'll be agreed with each of the contributors. Um, and then you can compare your data against others who put their information in this database. And so uh, there's a meeting in January about structuring this. But this is, this is going, going to be coming along. And this is how we're structuring our data under the, uh, the Blue Carbon Monitoring System. And right now, for instance, we have nearly 1,000 data points on lead 210 carbon accumulation rates around the country. And attached to that, there will be a modeling component. Um, here we're going to be looking at the, the wetlands response to sea level rise. Uh, I recommend, uh, if you're interested in, in this, looking at the Marsh Equilibrium model. It's been developed by Jim Morris. And it's a really nice model. It includes wetlands response to sea level rise from a mineral sedimentation point of view, from an organic sedimentation point of view, using um, some understanding of, of plant productivity, uh, as well as the soil decomposition, soil compaction components. So this is a, a very nice model. And we're, we're calibrating it now for those areas around the country. And it'd be great to apply it in other parts of the country as well. Um, this, this project focuses on the natural wetlands. Uh, but as I mentioned, the emission side is really important. So we need more data on the emission side, too, and more studies at the local level there. Because that really is a big data gap that still needs to be filled. So Steph mentioned examples of carbon projects. And I'll, I'll run through some of these and how they fit with adaptation strategies. You know, all these conservation activities, there's going to be a methodology, but you know, outside the carbon market, you know, protecting at-risk wetlands is the biggest thing you can probably do in terms of carbon management. Uh, improving water management on drained wetlands, reducing CO2 emissions from drained wetlands is one thing. Um, improving uh, water management on standing water is also, I should add that to the list. Uh, sediment recharge on coastal wetlands. Uh, creating space for wetlands to migrate. I'll come back to that. Oh, sorry. Um, and then there's the restoration side, lowering water tables on impounded wetlands. 
you know, reducing methane emissions, raising the surfaces with dredge material to keep wetlands intact. You know, that's what they're looking at in the Mississippi Delta, rerouting the sediment supply or restoring the sediment supply to keep wetlands, keep wetlands going. Um, removing dams, bring back wetlands again, restoring salinity conditions, improving water quality. You know, the, the example of Tampa Bay where they've, see, where they've restored 12,000 acres of seagrass, a wonderful example of, um, of bringing back blue carbon ecosystems. Revegetation, and then combinations of the above. So Steph mentioned this, and I wasn't going to include it, but then the question came up, what, what kind of projects was it that was looked at in, in the Snohomish? Um, so this is what the landscape looks like now. A lot of emergent, well, some emergent wetlands now. It used to be a lot of forested wetlands, just like this. Um, Snohomish represents 29% of the wetlands lost in Puget Sound. And around about 15,000 acres were drained overall. And right now, you know, around about 4,000 acres 1,300 hectares are planned for restoration. Um, this is what the system looks like. These are the restoration projects which are planned. Uh, the Quilult project was just reconnected. I, sh I, could have, I should have shown a video. We've got this beautiful video of the time series of the reconnection taking place. And then these wetlands have either been enacted or in planning. Um, this is what the system used to look like, forested wetlands. And now they're looking to restore, they may potentially restore most of the estuary, um, depending upon landowner preferences. Um, what we did as part of the project, though, was include, and I, I recommend this if you're doing projects here also, is include where, what's going to help with sea level rise and think about your project boundary. Because you have, you know, down here your coastal wetlands, but this is a, a nice gradual coastal floodplain. These will become coastal wetlands in the future. And so then you have to think about, you know, how are you going to, what's your um, flood management strategy in the interim, what's going to happen in the future. So we, we calculated the carbon stock change over this entire area as part of the assessment. And uh, one of the things we're thinking about, or one of the things that's going to be a discussion in the Pacific Northwest is, you know, as a demonstration activity, can we turn this whole area into a blue carbon initiative where landowners can start to think about how they fit in with ecosystem management, ecosystem services, and recognizing long-term change in terms of climate change as part of that planning process. So that'll be very exciting if it kicks off. So this is what um, some of the analysis here, what I'll step through is, here are some of the, the natural wetland areas restoring and then potentially restoring areas over there. Now what this, what this graph represents is, this is elevation of the landscape now. Um, this bar here represents what the wetlands were at. This is the mean high, high water elevation, where you get your wetlands at uh, relative to tides. You notice the tidal range is somewhat bigger here, about eight feet than it is locally in this neighborhood. Um, this range here, the green, is the range in which vegetation comes in. So it colonizes here. And this is where you know, your, your wetlands really sort of come to an equilibrium elevation. And this is the land surface where most of the uh, uh, projects are right now. So this, as lands were drained, you know, the dikes were built, the lands were drained, the elevations dropped because the carbon was released from the soils, some soil compaction took place. So the amount of CO2 which was released represents the amount of carbon that was within these soils as they dropped down. The amount of carbon you get back again is when the, the surfaces build up from mudflats to vegetation coming in, and then as these, as these systems then build back up again. Now this is a very vigorous system in terms of, of plant production. Um, there, I'll show you some pictures of the plants. So here's the um, sediment accumulation rates and then the carbon accumulation rates within the system. The natural wetlands are sequestering carbon at around about you know, 100 grams per meter squared per year, around about one ton of carbon per hectare per year. And that's what's going on in the natural environments. But in this case, the, the one site where we have a couple of data points for, North Eby Island, which breached through Mother Nature. We didn't do anything. The, the storm just came in and flooded, you know, knocked down the levees, and nobody built them back up again. It's been rebuilding wetlands at around about one to one and a half centimeters per year. And it's been sequestering carbon at a fixed rate of around about 350 uh, tons of carbon per year since that time. So that's a pretty good number. But actually, we have very few numbers around the country of carbon accumulation rate with, with restoring wetlands. So we did, you know, we, we looked at the restoration potential, and we quantified the carbon stock change within this area, and then we we'll sea level rise on top of that. And that's the numbers that Steph reported. Oh, and here's the vegetation. So I'm curious whether you have vegetation like this down here. These are reeds, so these are bulrushes. 
And the reason they sequester a lot of carbon is they put down rhizomes. And rhizomes have a lot of lignin, and so they, 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 they really suck down the carbon in the, uh, in the soils there. So here's the numbers that Steph presented. Uh, plant restoration, about 1,300 hectares. Uh, would, would sequester around about a million tons of CO2, building all those wetlands back up to sea level. But then with future sea level rise, they actually sequester a bit more. And these are pretty resilient marshes that will keep pace with sea level. So they'll sock away another um, 1.3 million. So total sequestration about 2.5. All for the, just those projects alone would, would offset around about 5,000 cars per year. Not a big number, but a positive number. So that's the, the important thing. And of course, the real reason that they're doing a lot of the carbon sequ they're doing a lot of these projects there is for fisheries. Fisheries is the real driver. But this is an additional benefit that could be recognized. And it's an additional benefit that more money, say from federal agencies or, or um, local uh, companies invested, looking for uh, socially responsible investing, might finance carbon projects for. Uh, another example, uh, before I wrap up, um, this one may be more representative of what you might find in Texas. Uh, this was a project where we worked with the TNC um, to look at climate change impacts on the near shore environment of Southern California. This is the Ventura coastline and the Santa Clara River. And so um, we looked at flood management impacts uh, down the Santa Clara, uh, what the restoration potential could be in there, how sea level will impact shoreline erosion along the shore face. But we also got a chance to do a little bit of a greenhouse gas assessment in Magoo Lagoon. Uh, down here, where there's a little bit of a complicated landscape, but we had some wetlands. It's not a very big area, but it was a chance for us to integrate some of the thinking into an adaptation strategy. So this, this, you know, this is on a very small scale, maybe a little bit like what you might find in terms of Texas, a, a low-lying coastal plain, sandy sediments, some land use behind, uh, one of which being a military base, which a lot of military bases in, the, in coastal areas. And uh, just, to, just to zoom in a little bit, so this is the area where we did modeling. Uh, we used a SLAM model. You, you may have heard of it, um, sea level rise uh, uh, adaptation model. I think that's what it is. Uh, we rebuilt it in GIS um, to increase its functionality. Uh, but basically, we looked at how sea level rise would impact uh, land cover change, and then what the different management strategies might be, hold the line, allow retreat in terms of the greenhouse gas implications. And uh, so there's agriculture in here. And what I'll draw your eye to let me, uh, is um, there are actually some freshwater ponds here, um, which I'll come back in terms of the methane emissions. We assumed we'd hold the line on the military base. They were quite keen on that. Um, but uh, we assumed agriculture would, would transgress. Well, we actually assumed two scenarios, hold the line for everything, and then the transgression would include uh, letting um, non-urban areas um, be flooded. Oh, and this is just the, the land cover types. The, 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 the green here is freshwater tidal wetlands, uh, is freshwater ponds. Then we have saline wetlands here, and then different land uses inland. And so uh, the numbers are not so important, uh, but just to show the scenarios, the dotted lines are where you hold the line. And uh, this, is, this is net sequestration. Uh, sorry, this is net, uh, this is net emissions. Let me get this right around. Less sequestration on the bottom, uh, more sequestration on the top. And so if you hold the line, then um, you gradually lose your wetlands, so you lose carbon sequestration potential. And you release CO2 back to the atmosphere through the erosion of the wetlands. Yes. So if you maintain a seawall, you maintain a bulkhead, and the, the wetlands with sea level rise eventually squeeze out with time. Uh, but if you allow the wetlands to migrate, actually we had a net positive through time just because of the topography. We created more wetlands as, as the, the lands behind flooded. So there's a feature of the topography there. But actually the biggest benefit was this line. This is the, if we included just reconnecting those freshwater ponds back to the tides. And just by reducing the salinity, you reduce methane emissions. So the biggest bang for your buck effectively would be just to reconnect those, those areas without getting vegetation back. If you got vegetation back, that was an additional benefit. And so we, we identified that. Of course, there's, there's a lot of questions there about preferences. 
because those lands are managed for ducks and other wildlife, and so they probably have a preference to maintain that. But there may be something they can do in terms of salinity. We didn't get into that. But we just wanted to identify that managing methane on impounded waters may be one of the most significant things you can do in small-scale, or even large-scale coastal areas. That's also additional to these other options that you have. What we really need to start getting into is thinking about these different options of the landscape. We haven't got to that stage really yet, about those kind of trade-offs. And uh, so that's kind of the next direction uh, where we might be going. Uh, one place we're starting to look at some of these trade-offs is actually Tampa Bay. And here we're, we're doing the same sort of slam level analysis for the entire bay. Um, there was a model already developed, a TNC ran a model, and then um, the ecosystem, uh, the estuaries program uh, ran a model as well. And you know, what we've seen in Tampa Bay is actually a decline of ecosystems through time. And then around about 1990, they've, done a, they've held the line and then they started to improve it. And uh, seagrasses are improved. This is actually in the tidal wetlands. And then the future could be either with managed retreat, creating space, an increase in the tidal wetlands area, or if they hold the line, a loss of wetlands area through time. And what we're trying to do right now is trying to connect together how we think about an adaptation plan strategy for Tampa Bay and how that links also with your mitigation strategy so that you balance conservation, land use, restoration, climate change responses. And hopefully all being well, that report will be out in March or April of next year. Um, Steph, do you want to... Um, so just to wrap up, uh, from a restoration practitioner's point of view, thinking about the types of projects that would make good carbon projects, and then Scott will give a lot more color uh, from, from a carbon project development side. Characteristics are good projects. Economies of scale. And these are some of the challenges we have to try and overcome as we're working through this. Um, most forestry projects are really big. You know, Scott's going to talk about some really big projects. Um, they're often 10,000 hectares in size or more. We tend to work with a lot smaller projects. So we have to think about how, ways, how do we group small projects together within a landscape plan and do the accounting on those to try and bring coastal wetlands into these kind of planning activities. Um, the early projects will be those which have a high greenhouse gas benefit. So the avoided emissions of CO2, nitrous oxide, and methane are probably going to be the most attractive to begin with because they're the most certain. Um, but also, you know, some of the higher sequestration ones, forested tidal wetlands, I didn't really talk about them, but if you restore trees as well as soils, um, I'll not mention subsidence reversal, salt marshes are also a relatively simple one, no, no methane. Um, Scott will probably talk about financial fitness. One of the things I'm really interested in, in hearing more from David about, maybe in coming time, maybe in discussion, is, you know, we talk a lot about stacking credits, but can we actually illustrate stacking different ecosystem credits, and how do we bring that together within these projects? I think that's really something we've got to tackle moving forward, because this, this might be the, sort of the, one of the things that gets us over a hump, is if we can quantify and financially recognize these credits, these, these, these benefits, that's where, the, um, that's where projects will start to really take shape. Uh, low complexity, low risk, um, clear greenhouse gas reductions. If you can recognize resilience to sea level rise and you also have community support, um, those projects are going to be more attractive. And, as, as we've talked about, linking with adaptation. What you don't want is a project where you, you're counter to adaptation to climate change. Um, you really need things to be um, connect together. And to give a little example, um, for instance, th there was a project in California, a small basin called Soap Lake. It used to be a, little ta used to be a, fr a freshwater wetland. And then agriculture came in, converted to agriculture. And then around about a few years ago, a mitigation banking company wanted to create a mitigation bank right in there. And they did a good job. Um, they created credits for certain endangered species uh, based upon the hydrology. And then TNC wanted to come in and restore the entire catchment, and provide easements to, to landowners to adjust their water management practice. Now, in doing so, the hydrology was going to change on this little mitigation bank in the middle. So the mitigation bank, because now it would be out of compliance, would be, became an opponent of wider ecosystem restoration. Now, the same sort of thing can happen with, with 
climate change mitigation projects, if you don't think of the landscape scale, you can start building projects which will conflict with long-term adaptation. So if you develop an adaptation strategy at the landscape scale, or at least understand the changes, you then place your mitigation strategy in that context, and your likelihood of success will greatly increase. Don't try and do a mitigation project without that landscape context if you can avoid it. Oh, and timeline. This is um, something that I think about. People have finance projects might want to return within a few years. If you're the government, you might not want to return for 50 years. Um, you might not want to return at all. It's all about the social good. So depending who you're working with, they may have a different perspective on you know, how financing fits into all of this. And I think with that, I'll end there with a photograph of what wetlands look like in, in California and what we hopefully hope to re re return again, having destroyed 95% of them. And uh, I'll open the floor to any discussion or questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Any questions? Please. Corps of Engineers on the learning curve with it. Where's the Corps of Engineers on the learning curve with all this? Um, yeah, they, you know, they're tracking this. They, um, it, I think it all really depends upon how the, the federal review of different regulations sort of feed through the process. Um, there's a question out there that if you include carbon as part of the, see the 404 permits, then instead of like uh, whatever the ratio is right now that projects get mitigated for, you might need a much larger area to recognize the emissions that take place when you convert a wetland. Um, the core are kind of watching this, but they haven't, you know, they don't factor this in as far as I, I recognize just yet. Maybe add a little color to that. So the, the principles and requirements that I was talking about earlier for federal water projects of which the core is then you know, mainly falls uh, falls under that. Um, they were the only federal agency that is currently exempt from having to follow that. Um, there was uh, legislation passed, and there was a rider on the legislation that that keeps the Corps from having to to think about ecosystem services at all. Which blue carbon is one. So any federal water projects now that the Corps is involved, they don't have to look at that at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just a little bit further color because. Um, I was at a, a conference yesterday um, in New York on natural infrastructure, and the um, chief scientist from the Army Corps was there uh, on a panel. Um, and he said that they were very supportive of um, this idea in how to integrate um, gray infrastructure you know, with green infrastructure. And so that, that's kind of where their head was at. I mean, obviously, um, there's a lot of... Uh, work to go there, uh, but they're engaged and, um, and committed to, to at least um, considering the issue. I think so. Just to add a little bit to that, I think it's a good point is, you know, the, the, the third slide that I showed about natural infrastructure, um, the, what was called the Living River concept was developed in San Francisco Bay, um, actually opposing a Corps of Engineers project for flood management in the Napa River system. And uh, it was developed and it's, it's now been implemented uh, the Corps of Engineers now have a national um, living rivers program. And so they do actually adopt, if we can de demonstrate good practice. And so part, through the blue carbon aspects, that, this little part of all of that green infrastructure, I think if we can demonstrate in different parts of the country the application, then they feed their way into, into big organizations like the Corps of Engineers. They were at our last workshop, too, so that was really pleasing to have them there in Rickery Bay. Uh, did some of that include, like, uh, the, the, you know, the HGM wetlands analysis method? Uh, have you ever seen where any of this, they're looking at applying some of this with it? Um, yes, you know, in, in San Francisco Bay, we, we tend to take the landscape approach. We include HGM um, type analysis into it. And so uh, it's very much about developing a multifunctional landscape, recognize all the values of wetlands in there. Um, there, that project was driven by flood management requirements. But by setting back the levees and restoring wetland floodplains, you can have a, a demonstrable uh, reduction in flood risk, reduction in flood management costs. But you also got the ecosystem uh, services benefits that you would get 
Uh, in that case, they'll recognize as core benefits under sort of HGM assessment. Sorry, just final comment there because it sort of triggered another um, comment yesterday, which is probably good for this group, which is, um, you know, the, the engineering behind gray infrastructure is, is really well understood. And uh, so folks like the Army Corps, uh, you know, when they're looking at, uh, you know, blue carbon or green infrastructure, you know, the science behind that has to be equally as strong um, to convince uh, those sorts of groups that it is a viable strategy. So, um, and I think everybody, you know, at least the scientists yesterday um, at the panel acknowledged that it's a bit further behind but catching up quickly. So, um, sort of an opportunity for people here who are um, studying that to, um, you know, start, start to gather the data that uh, would convince, you know, the civil engineers um, of the um, the effectiveness of those of those strategies yeah. over gray infrastructure right and so that was the uh, the, the whole purpose for the um, the office of science and technology and policy and the, and the policy that, that we wrote up was to, to force the mission agencies to actually begin to take action and put resources to exactly what you're talking about to to generate those similar coefficients on green infrastructure that gray infrastructure has that when you're engineering something you could, you know, think about maybe even a hybrid approach. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. All right. So join me again in thanking all of our morning speakers, really.